Hello everyone, Happy New Year. My name is Kenya Miranda Verdugo and I am the Smart Justice Program Manager with the Michelson 20MM Foundation. Thank you so much for joining this continued conversation where we will discuss California's best practices for students transitioning from prison to campus. Before we begin, and as we give folks a few minutes to hop on Zoom, I would like to share a bit of background on our foundation and describe what we have in store for you today. Founded by Dr. Gary K. Michelson and Alia Michelson, the Michelson 20MM Foundation is a private nonprofit organization that seeks to accelerate progress towards a more just world through grant making, programs, and impact investing. Four years ago, we launched our Smart Justice Initiative to leverage higher education as a catalytic force for transforming the lives of justice-involved individuals, while also reforming the justice system itself. We work to transform the communities impacted by our country's punitive legal system to forge brighter, more prosperous futures via education. As part of that commitment, we are proud to, we are proud to recently form the Smart Justice Think Tank, which is a coalition of higher education champions and directly impacted leaders in California. The Smart Justice Think Tank developed a guiding framework to inform a common agenda for scholars, advocates, practitioners, legislators, and reentry organizations in post-secondary higher education, both in prison and on campus programs. This framework is what we call California's best practices, pathways from prison to college. We will drop a link to our best practices land page in the chat. Next slide, please. Today, we have the honor of hosting a few members of the Think Tank who will share their expertise having helped incarcerated students legislatively, educationally, and institutionally. Here we have an overview of all of the California's best practices. Next slide, please. And these are a few of our Smart Justice Think Tank members we will be seeing in the webinar today. Next slide, please. These are also the organizations that some of our think tank members are in. Next slide, please. So today we are going to be talking about California's best practices, students transitioning from prison to college. That is gonna to be today's focus. Um, so these best practices include creating a process so that transitioning students have access to personal documents, ensuring that students obtain copies of their transcripts, offering clear information to transitioning students regarding the California Community College, California State University, and University of California enrollment and transfer processes. Next slide, please. Additionally, the other best practices are providing access to affordable on-campus housing, financial aid services, and support, facilitating connections and accessing networking opportunities with potential employers and their respective career interests. And lastly, offering community resources to provide information about employment and licensing barriers due to conviction while giving assistance to obtain legal advice to better assist transitioning students pursuit of their careers. As a quick note, the opinions expressed in this webinar are each participant's own perspective, which in no way represent the opinions or views of the Michelson 20 MM Foundation. Before we get started, I would like to remind everyone that you will be able to ask questions via the Zoom Q&A function throughout panel discussions. During our previous webinar, we discussed the barriers that students inside prisons face and how the best practices can ensure that adopting institutions break down those barriers. Today, we will be discussing the struggles that students in prison face when transitioning into re-entry and on campus and how the best practices can address these challenges. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Today, we have Kermit Ryder, who is Professor and Vice Chair of Criminology, Law and Society at the University of California, Irvine. She studies prisons, prisoners' rights, and the impact of prison and punishment policy on individuals, communities, and legal systems. She is the author of two books, 23-7 Pelican Bay Prison and the Rise of Long-Term Solitary Confinement and Mass Incarceration, 
She is the director of Lifted, a program to offer the University of California bachelor degrees to incarcerated students and the co-founder of UCI Prison Pandemic, a digital archive of incarcerated California stories of living through the COVID-19 pandemic. I would also like to introduce Nohelani Kasperson. She's currently enrolled at Cal State Fullerton for Human Services. From her release in 2016, she has worked towards change and transformation during her time at Cypress College. Currently, she sits on the Rising Scholars Advisory Committee and continues to learn and grow. She is very grateful to develop the work we get to do as a collective. It is also my pleasure to introduce Patrick Acuna, who is the junior of social ecology at the University of California, Irvine, who believes in the transformative power of education. He began his journey while confined within the Security Housing Unit, or SHU, at Pelican Bay, and having graduated with honors from Southwestern College, now dreams of pursuing his postgraduate degree. After three decades of incarceration, Patrick knows that in doing so, he'll be a powerhouse within the prison reform arena. His biggest accomplishment to date involves GED tutoring for those convicted of a crime. From personal experience, he understands how educational accomplishments are instrumental in reclaiming personal dignity and fundamental in the pursuit of higher education. When he's not at UC Irvine, Patrick scours the backcountry for hitting fishing holes with his yellow lab mash by his side. Lastly, we also have Stephen Green, whose research interests include criminal justice, policy reform, punishment, sentencing enhancements, rehabilitation, re-entry, and the use of life without parole. His educational goal is to earn a PhD in criminology and to become a professor. Stephen transferred to CSU Fullerton after graduating with honors and six associate's degrees from Coastline Community College. So I just wanna give a really big welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you all so much for being here. We will now begin the first panel discussion. And as a reminder to the, to the audience, please feel free to ask questions to our panel using the Q&A function during this discussion. I will now begin with the first question. And I just wanted to um, ask the entire group, all of our panelists, what the thoughts are on the best practices we will be discussing today um, and how do you see them working for the benefit of not just the students, um, but the faculty and the institutions as a whole? I'm in such good company uh, with folks who've experienced this firsthand, but um, as someone who's working on building a program, I'll just say briefly that I think it's, it is so helpful to have benchmarks and principles to follow in this work to point to um, and to have them articulated in collaboration, particularly um, with folks like the rest of the panelists who've really experienced what it's like to try to earn a bachelor's degree behind bars. And so, you know, even as I'm building our program, I think all the time about the importance of space to study and how to advocate for that for students, the importance of access for everyone who's inside, the importance of technology. And it's not just the principles, it's also this community of people who are advocating for these principles with um, higher education providers, with prison officials, and with state legislators. And I think that's some of the excitement of this community. Anyone else want to take a stab at the question? Can you repeat the question, please? Can you, can you restate the question for us? Yes, sorry about that. Um, I was just asking how the best practices that we are gonna be talking about today, um, how they're beneficial to not just students, but faculty and institutions as a whole. I would, I would say that anytime that, when we're talking about it on the inside, when people are still incarcerated, I would say that if people are focused on uh, learning and earning a degree, that it does take away time from them, um, you know, participating in what I've considered, you know, negative environment with, with you know, um, with all the trauma that goes with that, right? And so they're concentrated and they're focused on, um, you know, trying to better themselves and improve their environment and their community that they're currently in. And so with that, it'll make a safer institution. So they're, so from my, my point of view, there's a win-win for everyone, right? And then the families, 
um, who support them also get a benefit by seeing that their loved one is changing and they're, and they're trying to prepare to come home and they're looking for the, towards their future. Um, once, once coming home, I mean, obviously like, you know, the opportunities just open up and they're in front of you and it's just a matter of us, uh, you know, walking through those doors as they present themselves. And I don't know if you've seen in the chat, someone was asking for closed captions to be uh, presented. Yes, thank you, Jen. If you can please turn on the closed captioning. Thank you so much for your responses to the question. I will move on to the next question. Um, what challenges did any of you face during enrollment while being incarcerated or being recently released? So this would be enrollment um, into the college system. Well, I know one of the situations that I walked into very early on was the idea or the uh, the dream that I wanted to go back to school, but no assistance or instruction on how. So um, I wasn't able to go to school when I was inside. So when I got out, I knew I wanted change. I knew that education, especially higher education, could assist in that change. But I am from Hilo, Hawaii, and I'm out here in Orange County, California, and uh, I'm going to my PO's office or telling her like, hey, I want to go back to school. And she's like, that's just unrealistic. You need to get a job. You need to pay for sober living, you know, and I wasn't given the opportunities. And I really had to do the work that it took to navigate how to make the space and time and, and try to develop some kind of a resource list for others who get out and want to go back to school. You know, uh, I have no family here. I had no friends here. I didn't know anyone, but I knew that I wasn't able to leave the county. And so that was a big challenge that I walked into initially, uh, just navigating or understanding. I'm, I'm a first generation college student in my family. And so uh, even the people I could call couldn't give me that advice, you know. Yeah, um, myself, it was important with regards to being able to start while I was in prison, because when I got out, thanks to Lifted, I was able to more so hit the ground running and my case was was different what about my case um that i didn't have parole so i didn't have that added barrier of being restricted to a certain county or, or a region i was able to uh go wherever i needed to go because i'm from la county and going to school in irvine might not have been as easy as it was for me but even with that i feel that i've struggled with technology and time management um everything out here is just computerized and what we had was a problem on the inside where you know uh Karamit could probably speak to that more and uh people like jen gomez was getting us all 25 of us enrolled because you don't enroll in irvine or most colleges on paper anymore so that was a big struggle, but had I needed to do it on my own or even some of the things I'm needing to do now just to get housing and things like that, I get overwhelmed and I have to come and reach out to people, you know, more so like a, a Dr. Ryder or um, Steven and, and a lot of the people from the underground scholars right here on campus have been invaluable to me. Thank you for sharing. It definitely takes the village. Sorry, Stephen, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say um, it definitely takes a village, and you know, through expressing that, um, you know, it's definitely hard to do it on your own without already having the barrier of having been formally incarcerated. So, thank you for sharing. Go ahead, Stephen. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, what I would say is that my, the hard like. Enrolling on uh, coming after coming home wasn't particularly hard. There was a, a couple challenges, but I started school in 2008. I've been enrolled in school ever since, right? And so try, earning those six to eight degrees, um, you know, the, the enrollment process became, you know, very normalized, right? But the very beginning was extremely hard. I needed a social security number. They wanted a driver license number. You know, they want this information that we don't have. And I was I was incarcerated at 18. I, I didn't know my social security number by heart, so I had no idea what it was. 
I had to ask for it. There was no one to ask for it. Um, my wife, I think, found it, or I, someone found it, like in my transcripts, like on a probationary report. And so I was able to start doing it that way. Um, and there's some of the questions that they ask you, like I had no idea what an AB 540 student was. Does that apply to me? Um, you know, just all these different things, like you know, how, and how do we fill it out? And then when they're asking about domestic partnership, um, you know, for those who don't know, California prisons are very male toxic, right? With with that masculinity thing, and we're like domestic partner. Or what what is that? No, I'm not. I'm not. So you write these things, and they would reject your application, and then you have to learn to to get in the process and what that meant. And so that was pretty difficult for sure. One thing, all that I've learned from conversations with folks like you, and especially the lifted students, is there's the substantive challenges, right? Like there's this all of this, like how do you fill out this paperwork? How do you get it? How do you but there's this um, intangible challenge also of feeling like those layers of, of work to fill out that paperwork, I think, make people feel like they don't belong. Even our incarcerated students who we are so focused on trying to help succeed and create space. And, and I think one thing I've learned from them is just how important it is to to do work to make them feel like they belong, right? And it's something our, uh, particularly our former formerly incarcerated staff have been wonderful with, right? Like showing students pictures of campus, bringing them campus material, having wellness workshops. Um, and, and those things I just would have never thought to do, right? I'm so focused on the, can we get a classroom into the prison space? And so I just wanna echo what you all are saying that, that there's another layer of that that we don't talk about enough. And that that work to do is so important, right? I heard students say yesterday at a site evaluation visit that they feel like UCI students first and prisoners second, and that's got to be one of the best things I've ever heard, right? And and I think that should be one of our goals, right? Is is to to how do we make that identity feel like your first and primary identity in these spaces? That was the perfect segue. Thank you so much, Karamit, for my next question. Um, I know we're talking about, you know, challenges, um, transitioning out and, and needing these transcripts, needing this paperwork, housing. Um, but what has been the challenges going into campus, whether that's, you know, a culture shock? Um, I know, you know, imposter syndrome for when you're a person of color, um, formerly undocumented, undocumented, going into these spaces that you really feel weren't built for you. Um, can we talk a little bit about, you know, those challenges? So I think my first semester on campus, I really hid in the counselor's office with a couple of friends and like, I was super intimidated. You know, I go to, I was going to Cypress College at the time and it's in uh, Cypress, California. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm, brown and I'm covered in tattoos and I'm at least three times their age you know and so um and the campus is beautiful it's not uh anything that looks like something I grew up around so it felt like I was doing something wrong just being there and then I'd go into like the bookstore or I'd go into the classroom and people are friends. And I mean, if it wasn't honestly for, for God's intervention, the way that he was and showing me like at least one person every semester that I knew from a different version of me, like, I don't, I don't know how I would have made it through all of that stuff. Like, um, and, and we have a, a great program director that is, is, uh, was just a career counselor at that time. And Anne-Marie would let us, uh, formerly incarcerated previously, she would let us hide out in her office. There was like five of us at the time. And we would just uh, make plans. And by the second semester or third semester, we were planning our classes around the same time so that we could meet there at the same time. And that's kind of how uh, Fight Club came about in the first place. No, I, I agree with exactly what you were saying. Um... This is my first day out of prison. I was on campus and totally overwhelmed and how big it was and how young people were and how fast things moved. Um, if it wasn't for having people that were supportive around me, I think I would have probably just turned around and walked away and said that this wasn't for me. But now that I'm beginning uh, winter quarter and getting into the, the groove of things and still getting lost on campus, not knowing exactly where my class is and having to run halfway across. Um, things are getting a little bit easier, but I do, I do um, 
understand what you're saying about the imposter syndrome and feeling like I don't belong here and feeling that there's a, a culture shock going from many, many years in prison to, to this environment that it, that it is so beautiful. It, it's, I wish the guys and the women in there could see how beautiful it is out here and how that I have been welcomed. But again, you know, uh, I have been hiding out in places because I feel safer around the people I know, people that I've met that came into the prison. Um, I know I could turn to them and go hang out in their office or in the, uh, the space provided for underground scholars. It's like where I'm at right now, it's the first place I go when I come to campus because I feel like these are my people because they've known my struggle, they have a similar struggle and we're here to support each other because we know we're a minority on the campus. Uh, I would say that one, there, there's a culture shock and I, I agree with my counterparts, right? Like you go from a very structured environment to all hell break loose environment, right? And then um, in the more time that you did, I think that the, the bigger shock it is. So like me and Patrick, we it did 28. So, you know, I went in at 18 thinking in my mentally, like it's still like with rest of development, I think I'm these kids' age, right? Then, then I look in the mirror and I'm like, damn, I got a lot of gray hair. I'm down near 50 now. And so <laughs> there's that realization too, right? That, you know, um, it's just very different. And I, I went I went from, you know, Ironwood State Prison on a Saturday being paroled to Cal State Fullerton Monday. I was on campus walking around and that was a very big shock. And then another thing that was difficult is I went from correspondence courses that were semester long with soft deadlines because it's it's a correspondence course to semester is like in person with the teaching and that was fine but it's a different pace that you have to learn at and then you learn that these these are harder deadlines and so like if you don't turn the work in that some some professors they have the leeway to say no we're not making exceptions and others can others can do it um, and I'm sure there's another going to be another learning curve if you go to a quarter, a school that's on the quarters, right? Where they, it's even faster. So there's just different things that you have to, um, you know, learn to adjust to and, and be flexible with, that's for sure. So hearing about all of these um, challenges, how can in-prison education programs or uh, maybe CDCR itself, help create a more seamless process for transitioning students to on-campus in their parole or probation region if they have one. I'll go first if uh, no one minds. So but the, one, the one good thing about like Project Rebound at Cal State Fullerton is that they have, um, a relationship with the probation and parole office in our in our in our area and when I was on when I first came home obviously I didn't have a job and I was getting enrolled in classes but I didn't have my class schedule yet and so my parole officer he was used to calling on me anytime he wanted to just dropping by at the house anytime he wanted to and then one day he was like hey I'm, I'm you know I'm on my way um and I'm like I'm on campus like you, you're welcome to come see me on campus if you want and he did he showed up right and so that was good because I've heard other students in the past say that like, you, you better leave your class or you, you gotta, this is the time that I, I gotta meet you and uh, I'm not going over there. And I'm like, what's the difference between, you know, where I live at unless you're trying to search it, right? Or me trying to get my education. And so the, the pro office in, in Orange County are very supportive of Project Rebound. I'm sure, you know, uh, underground scholars as well. And so long as you're uh, on campus, they make exceptions for that. They'll go to visit there, they wanna see, you know, my, my profs or one of them was asking for like my grades, like, hey, what were your grades this semester? He was invested in me, you know, my success, right? And I think that's how they should all be. But I do believe there may be, uh, needs to be a relationship and not that adversarial role, right? Like they understand that education is, is a pathway to success and not me like being lazy and don't want a job because some people still view it that way. When I just want to say there is a big difference between my agent and my PO, right? Because one was like very laid back. My agent was very like, I'll just check in with you and would do things like uh, show up at the parenting class or whatever it was that I was in that was required. But my PO was the really structured and difficult one. And um, for me, it was uh, it was this constant like 
tug of war that was going on because I mean ultimately I was here in California right and and I had no support system initially and I have four beautiful children and so the reintegration process with my children took three and a half years you know because I have to fly to Hawaii for visits and so that that takes longer than usual but getting a travel pass and then um being in Orange County and going to Cypress College. And she's like, what are you going to school for? Like, you need to get your children back. Like, don't you need a job? How are you going to get a place? And and, and it almost made the fear unbearable, if not for uh, people I had met that have walked these steps already, you know, like for other women that were like, oh, don't listen to that, you know, don't listen to that. But, but my head was full of fear and my ears would be used as trash cans occasionally because I would hear these things as, as if I wasn't telling them to myself already right like that this is pointless for what you're 40 something and you're going to start an associate's degree you know like all, all of these other things like you need to get a job you need to support your kids you need to be a good American citizen and you know and so uh, there was a definite uh, conflict in, in the conversations that were happening from college and fellowship and my support groups who were encouraging the healing and the growth side of me and and then the the disciplinary action that was threatened consistently if I didn't uh get the paycheck stubs or the whatever else it was and make it to UAs and parenting classes in this class and whatever else I had to do um my experience I can't really speak to the being on supervision, like like the rest of the panel, um, because I didn't have that. But I could tell you that a lot of the same um, pressures that you felt regarding um, whether to go to school or to to get a job and start a career and maybe start um, vocational school, a lot of that came. I, I experienced that too, and a lot of that comes from preparing for release. And a lot of the thought was that. I'm going to go here, I'm going to get this job, this is what I'm going to do, and this is going to be my life. And then all of a sudden, an opportunity arose to go to, to go to UC Irvine and to pursue a bachelor's degree. And I mean, and who knows what else after that. But at the same time, there was that indoctrination of, I need a job, I need to be a contributing part of society to show everybody, look, hey, I'm not this threatening person anymore. And look, I can make good on myself. And for some reason, and, it, and, it's, and it's totally wrong, for some reason, uh, sitting in, in class and studying somehow seemed like less than, and, and it shouldn't, because it should be something that everybody's supported to aspire to, not feel guilty for doing. I talked to a couple of, uh, um, underground scholars the other day to two women and they were talking about uh mommy guilt about being in class trying to study and make a better life and at the same time not being there to make dinner because they have a late class you know and and that shouldn't be the case but unfortunately it is For our next question, if you could choose um, one, two, three things to ensure that incarcerated students succeed and complete their academic goals, what would they be? What would be your recommendations? And this could be within the prison system, educational system. Um, I definitely have seen what a miracle it is to have transitional housing for students coming home. Um, I uh, am still in in the work and still willing to do whatever is possible to see the dream of a women's home. But I do understand that there's a lot more licensure, especially with the children and everything else that happens. So it is a, a, a really big dream, right? To have a, a, a home that we could come to that would be safe and, and allow for the education and that, that support system, if you will. Um, but I think housing insecurities, irregardless, is is a huge deal. You know, uh, again, Orange County, California. I'm uh, released in 2016 and expected to pay rent for a place like this. And now, in order to get the kids back, you have to have a room for every uh, male and female different rooms. I said there's four or five of them now. You know, and so like, how can I? 
afford to get that much space or those many rooms for this many children to even qualify to think about getting them back. You know, it's, it's, it's really uh, seems so overwhelming that you almost want to stop before you start. Um, like I mentioned earlier, one of, one of the biggest things has been technology for me. Uh, and I, I was enrolled in a, a computer related technology class prior to being released from prison. So there's a lot of people that will be getting out that have no concept of what that means out here and how really important it is. Uh, and even with that, there's so many restrictions placed on the equipment that we're using to, to train on that once I got my hands on a, on a unrestricted device that, that I could message, email, and try to figure out how to link from a phone to a computer, um, even to do a Zoom meeting. I literally drove all the way from home in traffic over an hour and a half to get here so that I could sit down with somebody so they could show me how to turn on my camera because I can't seem to figure that out anytime I come on a Zoom meeting. And I've been on a few for class and various things. So having something that speaks to that on the inside to better prepare individuals to come out and to be able to tackle these obstacles, I think that that's something I wish I would have had. Um, to be able to engage in that and transitional housing would, would be awesome, especially if it was in, in, a, in a campus setting to be able to come into it and be able to have people that are, have gone through the same thing to be able to sit there and show me like, hey, this is how we do this. This is where we go. This is where we go eat. This is how you uh, get your, your, your student ID and you, put, you get, get put money on it or you could go for your meal swipes. Um, those things would have been important. And I think that a lot of times those are little small things that might be overlooked. But again, um, the strong community right here with uh, um, the underground scholars and supportive professors and, and various other professionals that are out here, that's been something that I've had to draw on um, more and more just to be able to not feel like I'm, I'm drowning out here and to be able to continue to go and, and keep pushing because it's important. And, you know, I just wanna let all the, the men and women that are in prison right now that maybe at some point will be able to watch this, just let them know that there is a support network out here and all of us that are coming home, we're here to help you. So I would say one, like, some of the recommendations and, and I'll go off some of the questions in the chat. One is like network and network period. And I know it's hard for a lot of us who are formerly incarcerated to network because we have to learn to trust people. And <clears throat> we don't do that easily. And I still don't do that easily. And trust has to be built, right? It has to be fostered. And um, I would say that also disclosing our background is a choice that each person has, right? And so that's, that's a very wide fishing net to throw out there. I'm very open with it. I'm on Facebook with it. I'm on Twitter with like my whole life is out there. So I'm not tripping. However, I have friends who um, they don't disclose at all. Like you wouldn't know, you wouldn't, none of us wear name tags, formerly incarcerated, even though we all think we do in our heads, right? Like they know. Um, so I would say network period. But then I would also say recommendation is to network with your professors, right? Like, I don't think Patrick would be sitting here if he wasn't networking, you know, with, with Dr. Wright or Dr. Karamat, right? Like, he, he wouldn't be here. And so if he was just closed off and, and quiet and just handed his homework assignments in, he, he would not be sitting where he is today, that's for sure. Um, and then I would also say learn, listen, learn, and act upon, um, you know, those who have treaded this path before you, basically, right? So, like, I was fortunate enough to come home to Project Rebound who has a plethora of people who've all done this and they encourage me to do office hours. They encourage me to, to go talk to my professors and I would disclose like, hey, this is where I'm at. This is what's going on. I have never felt rejected. I have never felt judged. Um, fortunately, that's my situation. And they have all encouraged me to continue to only do the right thing. And sometimes they'll even uh, ask for, you know, mentorship. Hey, we, we can help you mentor you through 
help you navigate more of what you want in your educational goals, whatever they may be. And then the last I would say is that, you know, it's perseverance, right? We're going to fail. We're going to fail again. I mean, you know, I, you just want to make them, you know, learning lessons. So if you fail once, fail better the next time until you finally complete, right? That's how that works. So, you know, with that, I'll be quiet. I'll add just one one thing echoing some of what you've said, you've all said, especially Patrick, is that I think, you know, getting more technology into prison for these programs is so vital, right? I, I mean, the fact that some of our students in our college program have laptops now is huge, but they're they're largely disconnected from the internet. They're extremely limited in what's on them. And as I always say, 95% or more of people are coming out, right? <laughs> and and as you're all describing, those technological barriers are so huge and anything that can be done inside to kind of give people those tools to be more comfortable, I think is is just such an obvious, easy thing that can ease the transition. And, and frankly, you know, I always think about in this work, how can we make the walls more porous, right? How can we bring more people in and get more people out? And I, technology is such an obvious way to do that also. And so I just, you know, I... I, I hope it stays on the forefront of people's agenda that you know the 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 system isn't going to break if there are computers and access to the internet. Lots of other places around the world have that, and it's starting. And it, you know, um, and we have to resist that <laughs> that argument. And the, to the extent we resist that argument, I think you know there are all these amazing collateral consequences that comes with it in terms of the benefits for people inside and and the ways it changes the institutions. So. Definitely. Thank you for those remarks. I think nowadays, um, you know, having access to, you know, digital internet technology, it's, I think it's considered a basic need, um, you know, with everything being online. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot of, you know, what we need are base, basic, you know, almost, it's almost a human right. Um, so thank you so much for, for answering that question. Um, I think we have time for one more question and then we can move to the Q&A. Um, so how do the assets and strengths that incarcerated scholars possess help them build their resiliency um, into ending up with their degrees? Um, I think I think that, well, honestly, I believe that people coming home from prison, uh, a lot of us, we're probably the best students on campus, even though we have many obstacles to um, or barriers to overcome, and most of them are, are are just right here. Because I know that I have these 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 thoughts in my head that I don't belong, or that somehow uh, this is the real world, and all the work that I've done in the past is somehow was was watered down or, or made easy so that I would be able to uh, progress because maybe a program needed to fail, I mean, to, needed to succeed. But, you know, for all the people that, that think that on the inside, that that is not true. The, the professors, they're giving you exactly what they give you out here. You're getting in there. So the work that you're doing and those, those grades that you're achieving and those high GPAs that you're holding on to, that's real. That's real. And, and you earn that. Um, but I believe that those of us coming home are also um, more driven and, and by, by virtue of surviving what we've gone through within prison system, the, the, the gangs, the shoes, um, correctional officers that may be a little bit not as friendly or other, uh, other incarcerated people around, um, we're resilient. We're, we're highly resilient and, or else we we wouldn't be alive we would we, that's just the truth you know we would have checked out a long time ago but we, we could continue to push and we take that same drive and we bring it out here and and there's no limit to what we could do because we have it in us already and all we have to do is get out of our way well and I want to say, it's something my sponsor always says to me, you know, whenever I get into this whining mood, she says, uh, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional, you know? And so uh, I had made a conscious and and maybe even unconscious to some extent of what it would look like, you know, uh, decision that I was done suffering, 
Like I was done suffering and I was going to do whatever it took and I was going to seek healing and I was going to seek growth and I was going to seek change. And all of those things are found in, in, in education, in knowledge, in wisdom, in connection, in, in networking, like Stephen was talking about, you know, like all of these things for healing my heart and healing my mind, I have to learn. And so first I had to learn how to learn, right? And so I had to get to this space where I could learn how to learn. And, and, and I found that in, in school, you know, and I still find that in school, whether it's a, a club or a program or, or, or a relationship with my classmates, you know, like I'm, I'm, I get the privilege of being that student now, you know, and I don't think it develops resiliency. I think at some point, I transitioned to that's just who I am. It's just a part of what we're doing for the rest of this life, for the rest of this gift, right? It's just how it is. And so not only do I get to have that resilient, but I get to be infectious with it, right? Like I get to create study groups and group text threads. And I just learned how to make a Discord group. Watch out next semester, right? Because I'm going to have groups with emojis every single time, you know? But all of these things to pull us outside of self, it, it really is something helpful to me because if not, I'll sit in my head and, and think that none of them want me to call them anyways. And so I just do it, you know, and I just do it. And that that level of, of resiliency, that level of bounce back, I never really had until getting to Cal State Fullerton, you know? And so it, it really is, it really is a beautiful experience to watch me become whatever it is I'm becoming. And, and to, to end it, the greatest gift is really watching other people become what they're becoming. You know, we all kind of get to grow up in this here and now moment. And, it, and it's really uh, amazing to be a part of any of it. I don't know if I have anything to add. Like she, she killed it. Um... So I would say like the trans, like what I call them transferable skills, like skills that we learned on the inside and then we can transfer on the outside, right? I definitely believe Patrick hit on the head, man. The study habits that we learn on the inside, it's hard to beat us, right? Especially when we put our mind to it, it's really hard to beat us. Um, I would say that the difference is as, as the longer I'm here and I'm starting to notice it, well, I noticed it last semester for sure, um, is that so much can be put on your plate and those distractions, because it's not just school, like on the inside, you know, I only had my five classes or four classes, or whatever I was doing, and everything else was just really not a factor. And then you come home and then, you know, I have wife, I have kids, I have a job, I have, I have this, I have that. And so those are all different directions I'm being pulled in, hence away from my study time. Um, but, but you learn, you learn to balance that, you learn to, 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 to navigate those waters, right, even if they're choppy. And then the second was soft skills. We, we learn on the inside because we don't have phones. The tablets are very new for us in California that we talk to one another face to face. We don't have a problem with communication. And, you know, that's great for the professors. It's also great for study groups, right? Like how Nealani said, the study groups, I missed that in my first couple of semesters. Like I miss having, you go, out, you go out to the day room and there'd be some people out there who would already have the same class with you and maybe having some questions about it. We would all sit at the day room table and have a study group and try to figure it out. Even if we were all misguided on the same concept, we at least did it together. And because, you know, there was no expert in there, right? And so we'd have to, someone would have to turn the paper in to see what, see how he got slapped around and give, give big of it back so he could correct the rest of the group, right? And, you know, now we're changing those study groups to discord, right? That's what we're doing now so that those skills are like, you just can't beat them. And, th and I would say you just can encourage to keep those up, that's for sure. I just wanna validate what you all are saying um, that you are not unique, right? I do think that, that students with the experiences you all have had do turn out to be some of the most incredible students in higher education. And you know, our first cohort of students, 60% of them made Dean's Honor List in their first quarter at UC Irvine. I can't imagine another group of students for whom that would be true, right? And, and, and just from the faculty side, I can tell you that every faculty member I work with who interacts with the student population and you know has that opportunity to do so in a concentrated way in prison and knows, right, as opposed 
experienced it in their classroom, they may not on campus, um, just can't stop talking about how incredible these students are, right? These are students who actually want to be in the classroom to learn, who do their reading, who are thoughtful, who develop the best study groups they've ever seen, right? So I just want to validate that what you guys experience, people see on the other side when they have that opportunity. And it's it's really amazing. You know, I, I, I've started to say that I think this kind of work can transform higher education by reminding people why they're here, right? When they have students who are this excited and committed to it. Thank you all so much. That was, um, I feel really empowered just hearing you all. Um, and like Nohilani said, you know, it makes me very happy to just see, you know, everyone on this panel's growth um, and continue to do the work that we are all doing to see other people grow in these spaces. Um, so thank you so much for sharing those comments. We will now move on to the live Q Q and A. Um, so one of the first questions we have is. How did you get to a place where you thought you could apply to college? Was it the program that gave you the idea? Or maybe it was, you know, yourself just wanting to, to become a scholar? Um, what got you to a place where you wanted to apply? So for me, um, I had been in California off and on for like maybe uh, two years because 2000 and yeah, so about two years and I struggled with it back and forth and back and forth. But someone that I used to meet up at, at the uh, office when we had to go check in and UA and all of that stuff, I ran into him again, who I call uh, my mentor and like a big brother now, Vince. And so I ran into him again and uh, Susan uh, after not seeing them for a little while and seeing the difference in them, like the entire transformation that had happened in a person that I, I knew, you know, I had had talked to him and had had these conversations with him and the language was different, the mannerisms was different. And and what I saw was like some semblance of, of like real healing was going on. He wasn't so angry and stuff. And so I was like, oh, I need to figure that out, you know? And so. I talked to his wife, which is uh, my Susan, and and she kind of bragged me. She was like, I'll, I'll help you pick your classes. I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll do that. And made it like super easy for me to like figure out how to take the first steps because I, I literally was shaking walking on campus the first time. Like my whole body was shaking. I was more scared to do that than some of the things that I've done in life, you know? And so really, if not having someone there to hold my hand, like, I don't know. Uh, for me, I would say, so I got arrested when I was 18 and I got my GED. So I think they offered at the time in CDCR. I got it within my first year of incarceration. That's like the assignment they give you. Um, and so I got that. And then for the next 15 years, there was nothing offered. I couldn't get called. There was no college courses on the inside, at, the, at least where I was at. So, and then the way we found out about it, even on our yard was absolutely insane. I used to watch these two individuals go in this classroom, like they would empty out the classroom and these two people would go inside and I could never figure out what they were doing, but I wasn't really, you know, it's kind of, you, you learn to kind of like mind your own business uh, inside. And so somehow one of my buddies had got into that class. So now there was three of them sitting in there. And so I was asking my buddy, hey, what are you guys doing there? And he was like, oh, it's, it's something for, you know, um, he had a hard time coming up with this, this lie he had to tell me, right? And so I was like, okay, I just let him, whatever it was, let him go. And then when the instructor came out by himself, I said, hey, what is that class right? What are you guys doing in there? He's like, oh, it's college courses. We're offering college courses. I said, what? What? You're offering what? Go, it's free? He's like, yeah. I said, do you have an application? He's like, yeah, I'm always wondering why no one signs up. I said, well, give me an application. I went and literally ran a thousand copy, passed them out to the yard, and everybody was signing up. Like, we started it up. Um, and, you know, people were hella mad at me, but other people were not. And, you know, we we that's what started my educational journey. And it was really just plateauing at a GED for 15 years and, and being, you know, like the uh, the one book scholar where you read a book on a subject and you're like, oh, I know all about it, right? Like that's, it, it didn't, didn't really work for me. And so I did, I find, uh, found a couple of classes and I just, just kept going, never stopped. Um, for me, school has always been a, a challenge. I grew up with uh, learning disabilities. And um, I, I just grew up thinking that I was stupid because I would fail everything I did. 
And um, so starting education in prison, I didn't really start it for myself. I started it for um, my younger nieces and nephews to just basically show them that, you know, and hey, even though we live in the same area, we come from the same background that you can do more than I did and more than anybody else is doing around you because most people are just stuck in that rut uh, of, of poverty and insecurity and just thinking that that's all life had to offer for people from our backgrounds. And I wanted to show them something different. I was serving life without parole. I couldn't figure out any other way to do it. Um, like Stephen said, there was no college unless you paid like lots and lots of money to go to programs like Ohio or Indiana, which were like the only two things that cater to correspondence. Um, but then earning a degree was just, it was just something to do really. And I, at one point it became not so much just about anybody else. It was, it was, I found that I was, um, I was growing and, um, becoming proud of, of who I was and, and doing these things and and learning that that I wasn't stupid that I, I was capable I could learn and that I still struggle with with dyslexia I you know it's, I don't think it ever goes away but I just have to work two three times harder to get it to get it down to get you know um the correct answer but but I get there and and through that I'm able to tell other people like hey man why don't you come try this why don't you why don't you enroll in a class and you know let me help you with your your GED and get you past that so that you could get enrolled in and you are capable of so much more so that's kind of like where I came about to be sitting right here but really a lot of it started when, when I was sitting in the hole I was sitting in the hole and you know, there was an older guy. He was a, he was also a, a gang member. He was a prison gang member, and he was uh, fated to spend the rest of his life in in Pelican Bay. And at one point, he handed me a book, and it was the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. And honestly, I read it because I was scared not to. I was scared that if if I didn't read this book and he asked me about it, that like I would be stabbed to death or something for not reading it. And because I was young, and that was that was what I thought prison was, you know, you do this or you die. And and for some people, that's exactly what it was. And um, I read it and I didn't realize it at the time, but that sparked something in me. Um, and it's something that I always look back and I draw upon for when did this start? And, and that's where it started, right there. It's sitting in the hole, uh, never expecting to get out, indeterminate, and thinking that this was the, the sum total of my life was to, to sit in this little square of, of a room and, you know, do hundreds and hundreds of burpees and wait for my door to accidentally pop so I could potentially attack somebody. And it was that book right there. And I think that that was his way of making uh, amends in his own life by passing education on to somebody and, and sparking them because I think he's seen in me that I still had, I still had hope. I was still young and, and maybe I can make a, a, a better choice. One that he wasn't willing to make for himself, but wanted to give to somebody else. And, and he couldn't just say, Hey man, get out of this stuff and, and have a life because that's the death sentence for him. But in a small way, it was a nudge down a better path. Thank you for sharing um, your personal experiences. Patrick, you're here even responding to comments while in the chat. So Zoom Zoom is nothing to you. You, you, got, you got this. Um, one last question uh, we have is, what main advice would you tell staff on campus so that they can pick up on the nuances of what formerly incarcerated students need and are afraid to ask for because of the fear of sounding inadequate? I'd say start with connection, like just being able to open up the door to have a conversation makes it a little bit easier when I have a question, right? Like just, uh, I mean, the little the classes are big sometimes, you know, like I've had a class in a lecture hall and there's over a hundred students and I'm not saying the teacher has to go around and, and shake hands or introduce themselves to every single one, but usually we're sitting right up front. <laughs> You know, and so just like a head nod or an acknowledgement to your first couple of rows can go a long, a really long way, you know. Um, 
I know for me personally, the professors that uh, have even made that eye contact or even said, have a nice day or something like that on the way out uh, makes me second guess that first time because I'm still going to walk away a couple of times, right? But by that third time, I'll be able to stop and say you too and, you know, and have that conversation. I would definitely have to agree with that, right? Like, just putting it out, putting the elephant out there, right? We definitely do not look like the traditional student trying to earn either associate's degree or, or you know, undergrad degree. Um, obviously, you can try to get your PhD when you're older too, but it's not always the case, right? So we definitely need something. And if faculty sees that, um, just the acknowledgement of that we're in the room. I think people like to have that acknowledgement anywhere, right? Like. Just, hey, how are you doing today? Like that little, you know, icebreaker um, can go a long way because then it also says, oh, you know, I've been recognized, right? I have value or worth and I'm in this classroom because they don't know what's going on in our head. Like we have all kinds of stuff going on in our head. Um, and usually it's all negative, right? Just from the years of an environment that we're in. And just for that little, that little, you know, human gesture of reaching out with compassion will spark, well, hey, when are your office hours? I, I need to show up for those. And then we have, start to have those conversations, right? And then if pe people feel comfortable disclosing and then just being supportive, right? Like I've never had, I've heard horror stories where people have disclosed to their professors and their professor who were like immediately, up, you know, about face, right? Like they, and I was like, what? And they were like, yeah, but then is the question, is it, is it my background or is it my, you know, my disposition, right? But those are different, different stories. But I would just say, just being friendly to one another, compassionate and remember that we're all people with, uh, you know, suffering severe trauma you know, living in this country and the things that we go through, right? Um, I think I think both of you said it pretty pretty well. Um, I know something that's that's professors have done, not necessarily for me, but just some of them in their classrooms is uh, engaging in small groups um, with students because leave it up to me, I probably wouldn't reach out to the student next to me because I feel, again, that, that imposter syndrome, uh, you know, uh, little, I mean, because that's, that's, that's valuable to me because when I walk around campus, you know, um, those soft skills you, Stephen was talking about, you know, the saying hello and the respect and things like that, um, it's, it's, it's different out here. And that, you know, you walk by and you say hi to somebody and it's just, they're just like, they don't even look at you. They're just straight ahead. And I don't know, if, and I'm left thinking like, is it, because I'm older, is it because I have tattoos and I and I look threatening, maybe, or is, is it? Do they have like things in their ear and they're they're just not hearing, or, or 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 what's the deal? But when I'm sitting in class and the professor says, you know, gives his spiel and then says, okay, you know, here's three questions, you know, find a small group and break break it down, and then we'll discuss it later. That's helped me a lot to be able to be a little bit more personable with my fellow students that I feel like that I'm, I'm, hell, I'm old enough to be their fathers, but um, that helps. So little things like that, that probably the professor is gonna do anyways was, was helpful. And, and you know, just saying hello and acknowledge you in class, I think is also important because I'm sitting there thinking that I really shouldn't be here and maybe people don't even want me here. I really want to thank you all so much um, for this really beautiful conversation. Um, I feel very privileged to have these connections with you all and to be able to hear your stories. Uh, so I just really want to express my gratitude. Um, I also want to extend my gratitude to the audience for attending this inspirational conversation that will hopefully serve many incarcerated and justice impacted students and communities. Um, if you'd like to sign the pledge and download the affirmation best practices, we'll drop the link to both of those in the chat. We'll also post the recording of today's discussion on our YouTube channel, the Michelson 20MM Foundation, by tomorrow. The next and final webinar in this series will take place on March 29th, 2023. Here's the link to register for the next webinar. And in the meantime, you can stay engaged by signing up for our newsletter at 20mm.org to receive news and updates about our Smart Justice Initiative, as well as our other events and programs. Again, thank you all so much for taking the time to join us. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you at our next series.